Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this possibly ill-advised uh, little series that I uh, said that I'd run. What I intend to do uh, in one way or another is to essentially work up to how Dolphin Agile actually works. Uh, and we'll do this over a number of such sessions, um, a number to be determined by how long it takes us to get there and when people get bored. Um, and there are various things we can deal with along the way, like adjunct boundary conditions and things like that that are uh, interesting to talk about. But I don't know where people are starting from. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start at the very beginning. There will be an unlimited set of um, Rogers and Hammerstein clips associated with this uh, series. Um, so um, we start at the very beginning and start off by defining the spaces and operators and things that we are working with, defining what an Android operator is, um, and we'll then work up through the AD stuff. Something that might surprise some of the people who are watching is um, unlike essentially every other uh, explanation of how this works that I've ever seen, uh, we're going to leave PDEs for a while. Um, and that's because to uh, chucking a PDE solve into the operation like complicates things as an inverse function theorem going on in there uh, in ways that actually obscure how the um, algorithmic differentiation and the reverse mode algorithmic differentiation works. So I think it's actually easier to get your brain around how uh, the what the ML people call the back propagation of these operations works, and then we'll come back and put the complicated operation in that's got the, the implicitness in it. And I think that's probably an easier way to do it. If it all fails horribly, then I apologize in advance. Okay, it's impossible. Uh, so let's um, start mm -hmm. at the very, very, very beginning. Um, and so we're going to assume that uh, everything in sight uh, is a real Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to make my life complicated by trying to do complex calculus because I'm not very good at it. Um, and uh, so if we assume that everything's a Hilbert space, so that means, exactly, and I always get the conjugations in the wrong way, and also nothing's differentiable, which is just horrible. Yeah. Um, right, so, uh, so being a Hilbert space means that we're complete, uh, which is really important because at some point we're going to start doing calculus. Uh, and because it's so complete means that all of your limits converge to things that are in the space as well. So all of the time that you start taking derivatives and doing uh, differentials, then that gives us some, some hope that we don't fall out of the space, which is uh, always highly inconvenient. Um, and it means we have an inner product. And this thing, is way, way, way more important than anything uh, else in here because the inner product that you have on the space is the thing that does the constant of the um, function composition, right? And the whole point of what we're doing is we are stringing together a whole sequence of function evaluations that constitute an algorithm, and then we're differentiating through that. And what we mean by stringing together is um, substituting values in. And when you differentiate that, you get a chain rule, and the chain rule works by the inner product of each function on the next thing in the series. So uh, that's what that thing uh, looks like. Um, so in particular, there are two sorts of Hilbert spaces that uh, we're going to encounter all the time that really matter. So one of them is Rn. And in particular, the special case where R is one, because at the end of the day, you essentially, in all practical cases that we care about, uh, we're evaluating functionals. So at the end of the day, you end up at R via whichever circuitous route you ended up in. <laughs> and sometimes we might have Rn as well. And the other ones that we care about all the time are um, finite element spaces and maybe the sub spaces that they're embedded in. So we might occasionally talk about things being in all of L2 or all of H1, um, but actually most of the time we get down to the nuts and bolts of calculation really quickly, which means we're really talking about finite dimensional subspaces of those, um, which is handy because we will also just assume 
all the time that we've got a convenient basis that we've already chosen for whichever space we're working. So um, various things that are only true up to a choice of basis, we'll just assume that that's fine. Um, so uh, because we're talking about adjoints, um, the other thing that's going to immediately rear its head is the friend of all of these spaces, which is their dual space. So the dual space, V star, is the space of bounded. Sorry? It's the nemesis. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, bounded is another word that uh, we need to insert here because in the infinite dimensional case we need to restrict ourselves in that way otherwise stuff blows up um, the good news is you can essentially forget that's happening because as previously mentioned in all practical circumstances all of these spaces are finite dimensional and if you're finite dimensional then all of your linear operators are bounded so like, it's fine. Uh, I have to put that in there because if I don't write that in there, then some pedant will say, oh, but in the infinite dimensional case, uh, it's only true if this is about it. Sometimes we send delta, delta x to zero. So um, what that um, means is, so practically, these things are operators that eat something from here and um, send it to the real space in a linear way. And um, this is where we bump into uh, the coolest theorem in all of uh, this area. And the one that you all let say, th this is the Reese representation theorem. And the Reese representation theorem, I at least learned in about first year, maybe first semester or second year of university. And it just seemed utterly pointless. And the reason it seems utterly pointless is because at that point, the only um, Hilbert space that you're really kind of on good friendly terms with is this guy. Uh, and in Rn, uh, the Reese representation theorem says that row vectors are kind of the same as column vectors. And you re read that and you think, I kind of knew that. Um, it turns out that if your inner product is anything more interesting than the little L2 inner product, then the Reese representation theorem is a lot less uh, straightforward. And so uh, what the Reese representation theorem says uh, in its Hilbert space form, and we're always in Hilbert spaces, so this is the uh, easiest way to think about it, is um, for, um, for all E star in the dual space, um, there exists a V in the primal space um, dual space, primal space, such that uh, for all U in the uh, primal space, V star U is equal to the inner product of the Um, okay, so that is, um, so it establishes the fundamental relationship between the primal and the dual spaces, right? So let me just slightly unpack for the benefit of anyone who hasn't uh, seen this before, what I just wrote here. So remember, V stars eat things in the primal space and give me reals. So we apply them uh, like <coughs> functions. There are other notations available, there always are. Uh, we'll try to remember to write it like this. Um, and this always is equivalent to taking the inner product with some member of the space. Uh, the big trip up and the thing that is like the blight of this whole area is if you're in Rn um, and you've got some, you've chosen your basis in Rn, you've presumably chosen the obvious basis, uh, then the numbers in the vector of coefficients that represent this guy are the same as the numbers in the vector of coefficients that re re represent this guy. And so basically what we're saying in Rn is, uh, if I think of the vectors in my spaces as being column vectors, then these guys are row vectors because row vectors matrix multiply with column vectors and give you numbers in a linear way and you have the same matrix. Uh, if you have 
any other finite dimensional space, then your um, uh, inner product uh, VU is equivalent in that basis. Uh, to multiplication with some symmetric positive definite matrix there. And I have very, very deliberately chosen big M there because if your space was big L2, that's the mass matrix. Uh, and if you're in H1, that space is the Helmholtz operator, the positive definite Helmholtz operator. Um, and so uh, now the relationship between the numbers in the vectors underpinning these guys is you multiply these, this guy by the mass matrix to get that one. And if you want it to go the other way, you have to multiply by the mass matrix. Uh, that is going to keep coming up as we go through the adjoint. Um, and it's actually, if for those people in the room who are interested in uh, optimizations or using the adjoints to um, then do some sort of gradient descent method, uh, when you get the gradient out, the gradient lives in this space. And if you then add it to something in the primal space, you've just committed a variational crime, which will give you uh, the wrong answer. So um, and it, this is unfortunate because uh, a very large proportion of the optimization software that's out there does not do this, gets it wrong. So there's a book up on the shelf that a very bright uh, master student called Tobias Schrader wrote, and let me put my name on as well. Uh, which explains all the ins and outs of that. And we can kind of dive through how some of that works. Okay. Um, you could maybe say that V is unique. And it's V not... is unique, thank you, yeah. yes. So and there is, and for each norm, one of these, there is a unique one of these and vice versa. And the dual norm is the same size as the primal norm. Yes. I told you there'd be some pedantic analysts around here. This is the part of the, the course that is really, really dangerous for me to be given because there are several people in the room who are better at this bit than I am. Um, also, right. David can't see the book I'm holding up. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's really cheat. Okay, right. Okay, so um, uh, let's so uh, so that's the kind of very, very essence of the spaces, and we'll come back and shove more properties in the spaces as we go along. Um, now uh, we need um, a few more operators than just that one. Um, so in general, <coughs> we're going to, having cleaned my board, I'm going to trash it completely. Um, yeah, you need to clean the rubber as well. Apparently. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That would be uh, uh, put it on the list of things I didn't think of. Um, right. Remind myself what I call this in my very incomplete notes. Right, so um, we're going to be working with um, operators that we're going to stack together. Basically, that's how these things work. And so we need to start talking about these. And the notation for this is just bad out there. Um, and so I'm going to use a notation. Uh, it may or may not be the right one. If someone's got one that's actually better, then we'll deal with it. Uh, I'm going to use a notation that is based on the notation that's used for uh, forms in things like UFL. So what I'm going to say is I have a parameterized multilinear operator. Um, is from F, it maps into some Hilbert space U. Um, and it is uh, parameterized by, which is to say, it's got some arguments that we assume we already knew, parameterized by. Um, some spaces, so I have to feed it some numbers from here, and it has arguments from some spaces. That should be zero. Um, maybe zero. 
and they're saying that you would conventionally put crosses between these to say that these are um, uh, tensor products, uh, spaces effectively. Right, so. Oh, is that J? That's for, oh, that's a colon. That's a colon. Okay. I apologize for my right. So I'm separating these two with colons because that's what you would do with the arguments yeah. to a function. Yeah, okay. um, and so uh, the distinctions are, so we typically assume at the point that we're looking at the function that we know all of these guys and we don't know these guys. So my operator is still, it's, a, it's an operator, linear operator in these guys, which has been evaluated, uh, arrived at by evaluating a nonlinear function at these points. Um, and uh, so the semicolon is a traditional way of uh, separating them. In particular, either of these sets can be zero or can be, can be empty. So um, if I just um, evaluate, so if I say, um, Uh, F of right, so that thing is a perfectly uh, reasonable function from uh, R to R, which is one of these things. It's got an R in here, an R over here, and nothing over here. Um, the reason uh, we will do that is. Um, uh, will become apparent in just a second because I'll differentiate that in a second because and they have differentiate sign. Um, so um, in particular, this is just a direct generalization of the uh, k-linear forms that we get in finite elements because uh, if I assume that u over here is r um, and then I shove my test handle trial spaces in here, I've just written down finite element form, but it didn't have to be finite. So in, in, anything at all basically fits this pattern. Um, and uh, the reason that's a convenient thing to do is because uh, this way of thinking about functions is the one uh, that plays nice uh, with Gatto derivatives. And those are the things that we're going to be doing ad nauseum. Mm, um, yeah, no, no cake yet. Um, <laughs> So um, I apologize for the general level of humor in this course, it's gonna get worse. Right, um, okay. So um, so I apologize if, if this is teaching people to suck, suck eggs, but um, the thing that I found most confusing about uh, Gatto derivatives when I first saw them uh, was the fact that uh, single variable calculus as you, uh, Learn it at school has a subtly different definition of what a derivative is from the definition that we use when we get to have a Gatto uh, derivative. And the, dis the, the difference is so, what you learn at school is uh, df, oh, I can use this here, df, dx, x is equal to cos x. And we learn that that's the slope of this line at, that, at this point. Um, when we use uh, <laughs> the, the, the definitions of derivative you get from a Gatto derivative, uh, the, the derivative of uh, sine x isn't given as cos x, it's given in the form that the derivative of sine x, uh, uh, of f of x choosing another function x hat is equal to cos x times x hat. Mm -hmm. um, and all that saying, and as I said, I apologize once again, if this is like blindingly obvious to everybody else, it wasn't blindingly mm -hmm. obvious to me when I first learned this. Um, all, all that we're um, basically saying is if I have my sine function, and I differentiate it at this point. Um, is the derivative the gradient of this line, or is it the equation of this line centered at an origin point here? 
that because that's the only two difference between these two things, right? This, if I put the x, if I multiply by the x on the end, I've transformed it from the gradient of the line to being the equation of the line. Uh, and it turns out here and forevermore, this is the one we need. Um, so let's go back and do that actually properly. So got this here and it, um, yeah. So suppose I've got this guy, because this is the most general thing that we know how to do. Um, so um, the data derivative of this guy um, with respect to one of these things, we'll do them in a minute because it's way easier. So we'll do the, this one first. This is the non-trivial one. Um, is um, uh, so this guy is now going to be a function um, which takes all of these guys, uh, sorry, comma, including whatever w, which, whichever m we're taking in respect to, all the way down to w zero. And it's going to now have an extra argument. So I'll call the extra argument w hat because it came from over here, but it's actually one of these linear guys. It's on the other side of the semicolon. And then I have whichever all of these linear arguments that I had lying around before, right? So that thing is equal to the limit as epsilon approaches zero. So epsilon is real number um, of F, all of this stuff, Wm plus epsilon w hat, uh, all of this stuff, semicolon, and all of these minus f, all of the previous values, and wm, semicolon, uh, all of, and all of the rest of it, divided by epsilon. Right, so what I've done is I've turned uh, my function f into a function with one more of these unknown linear arguments. And it turns up by adding epsilon times that nonlinear uh, non argument in here. So that is really, 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 really close to the high school definition of the derivative from the limits or if you went to high school in the UK, maybe the university definition of the <laughs> the thing from the limits. And um, uh, the difference is that when we just deal with real numbers, then you get to assume um, that uh, this thing might as well just be a basis function for the real numbers. And the most obvious basis function for the real numbers is one. And so you just end up with Wm plus epsilon in here, and you've just recovered the original definition of the group. So we're, we're a strict um, uh, generalization of that. And so what this means everywhere then is every time uh, we take a derivative, we add a new argument and the new argument is, so it's one of these uh, uh, linear things. And most of the time, um, we'll be much more concerned with how we plug these derivatives together than how we take the individual ones, because we sort of know how to take individual derivatives. But I will do one or two examples in just a second to um, illustrate this. I see people frantically scrolling this down. Um, so, um, okay, so let's just do a couple of easy examples of this just to hammer into our head what I meant by this. Uh, 
so uh, so let's assume that that is now going from R2 to R1. So now I've got really advanced. Um, Okay, so that's a really simple function to differentiate. Um, so um, if I, the, the, um, the data derivative of that is um, Not going to write out all steps and do it yourself if you really want to. The uh, the mere point that I want to make uh, with this very um, uh, simple case. Um, oh, let me get my hats. That's very important, right? So these things are on the left hand side. Let me do this. So, right? so this is f of x. This is the f the x of x semicolon x hat. And so what's going on here is uh, these are the ones we knew, or we knew to evaluate it. It's nonlinear in those. And here is my multiply by x, but now I'm in two dimensions. So let's take a double x. And so that is just equal to rad f dot x. So this is the really trivial one, which is the, the case that we were uh, thinking of earlier. Um, we can also do one which is a bit more uh, finer element relevant, uh, which is um, let's say, so now I'm going to write J because you can see where we're going with this. Um, Right, so square to norm of u, assuming u's a uh, scalar valued uh, finite element function. Um, and so And um, that is um, all, so uh, this is the first time, I guess, where we can uh, see something that we might recognize from, say, Feyerig, because uh, what I have just written there is, um, uh, Okay. That is that that on the right is that's legal UFO, assuming of it. If you want to, U is a function in some one element function space. So we've we've got up to the point where we can do not adjointy, no, no, nothing clever like that, just up to what it is that UFO basically does. Um and um uh in in um fact these things um compose. So I could take a derivative again. Um, and if I did take a derivative again, uh, then what I would get is uh, right, I should probably let's call let's call this first one B just to um just, just to cheat ahead so you can see where we're going. Uh, 
Um, I've just made a nice matrix. So, um, and what you show me. So, um, this is possibly an opportune moment to um, diverge briefly into the weird argument numbering convention that turns up here. Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you notice that um, every time I uh, take a derivative, I put another argument onto the beginning of this list. Um, so it's supposed to be a hat on the B. Depends uh, which way I do it. Okay, fine, I'll put it on the B. Uh, the B's unambiguous, but I guess maybe it's better to be. Um, well, it's consistent with the line bar. Yeah. Um, okay. So have I, have I got that the right way around? Uh, yes, I have. It uh, but, yeah. No, I mean, it does matter. It, it, it does matter because um, we have a definition of what a test function or what a trial function is, and we usually use V for test functions and U for trial functions. So I'm kind of keen to get this the right way around. Um, so, okay, so now, so let's let's do the uh, the numbering conventions that are going to pick this up and get us over and over and over again. So. Um, hey, David. Yeah. Sorry, just um, I'm being a bit pedantic, but I think it's important to say that when you do derivative ju, what you get is a function that goes from u hat to two integral u u hat. So it's like because you said it's the mass matrix, but it's so what you get is a function that, given the inputs, gives the mass matrix. No, uh, or is that, it's not very clear what is u hat and v hat. Okay, so um, the so. Actually, no. So let me okay. let me let me explain then the sense in which I've just said I've got a mass matrix. Um, so uh, when we have so um, one of the other like essentially uh, consequences of the representation theorem, if you generalize it a bit, is that um, all um, so all of the bounded linear operators or all the linear operators, because um, they're all bounded, on a finite dimensional space with a uh, known basis can be represented as row vectors. And all the bilinear functions can be represented as matrices. And it keeps going if you're insane enough to uh, uh, evaluate um, bigger ones. And the way you do this is um, straight out of the finite elements textbook. So you simply say, well, because these things are in a known basis, this thing is equal to um, the, uh, get this right way around. This is the numbering convention that I'm going to come back to in a second again. Uh, it's um, V hat I two integral uh, I J I I uh, DX U at J. Right? So that is uh, just expanding the uh, these things in their bases and observing that these are numbers and numbers can come outside the integral. And I'm using an Einstein summation convention here. Well, the consequence of using an Einstein summation convention here is that if I write down all of these things as a uh, vector, can't write that that way, around, u bar, and I write down all of these things as a vector v bar, and I write down all of these things as the entries u uh, j, um, and so that is what happens here. Um, the reason why it's not actually a function that you could evaluate and uh, get a mass matrix is because um, the uh, <coughs> thing that I didn't do and sort of slightly deliberately didn't do here was observe that this U actually isn't here anymore. 
So, and the reason it's not here is once I took the derivative of this stuff, this is a quadratic function, I took one derivative, it became a linear function, and I took another derivative and you disappeared. So it's just not dependent on that. Um, but that's not generally result. So the sense in which Alberto is kind of a bit right is if I don't choose this particular function here and chuck a general function in here, then in general, u doesn't disappear by the time I get to this point. And then yes, it's a thing that if I choose to evaluate, it produces a mass matrix. Okay. Hey, Bid. Yeah. What, what have you taken your second derivative with respect to? Uh, you. <clears throat> okay. Okay, it's you. Right, so each time I'm taking a derivative with respect to you. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so let's, so this actually, okay, so this is taking us even further into the numbering convention hell. Um, so, um, it's somehow conventional um, that <laughs> the, uh, when I talk about taking the action of an operator, what I do is I, uh, so the action of this guy, on um, running out of space here. Uh, let's, we don't need this stuff anymore. So, um, uh, Ruben's question, sort of, uh, and the answer to it kind of justifies the reason for separating between coefficients and arguments as well, because you always differentiate with respect to coefficients and, uh, and then add an argument. Yine. So, uh, it's that's not actually quite true. You there are circumstances. So imagine. So I said I wasn't going to talk about finite element problems. Uh, imagine I've got a uh, linear finite element problem. Uh, then when I go through and derive the adjoint formally, I am going to end up taking the derivative of the uh, linear finite element problem with respect to one of its arguments. Uh, the thing is, it doesn't do anything. Um, okay. But then I would I would just express the linear finite element problem as. Yeah, you, you can still express it with the solution as being a coefficient instead of an argument. I guess, yeah, that's true. Um, so uh, if you did take a, a derivative with respect to an, ar an argument, because you're known linear with respect to the arguments, what happens is you create a new argument, but the argument you originally have is going to effectively disappear. And the effect of that is that nothing changes. Um, possibly you renumbered your arguments, uh, which is see also what we're about to talk about. So, we have the concept of, uh, well, if I write it in, um, this thing uh, is a function of multiple arguments. It can start eating things. So if I apply this to something W, which we'll assume is in the same space, so this works. Um, Conventionally, this means substitute W into that argument position. It's the first argument. And in, uh, in UFL, you would write action EJ, B2J, I guess this is B2J, W. And this is exactly what it did. It would substitute it into uh, that position. Um, Problem with this um, is then um, the uh, action of a linear operator is equivalent to the dot product with the corresponding tensor. So if we're a bilinear operator, the action is equivalent to multiplying by the matrix. And uh, conventionally then, when I multiply by a matrix, I multiply <laughs> on the left. This is the, 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 the fact that we conventionally multiply on the, uh, uh, on the left is sort of where this whole adjoint is going to come in. It's what we're going to want to do sometime in the next session, probably, is uh, start multiplying on, uh, on the right. Multiplying on the right is the adjoint operation. And so that's, the, that's where this comes in. So uh, here, this is effectively saying that this operation here is if I uh, if I choose U and V, so if I take the actions on U and V, um, this is M times U and then times V. 
And that's because the conventional ordering of the indices on in linear algebra is such that we pull things off from the right. And the conventional ordering of, uh, uh, of the arguments in functions is that, we are, is that we substitute from the left. So these are backwards with respect to each other, uh, just two bits of math smashing into each other in a really unpleasing and inconvenient way. And so the way that we dig ourselves out of that problem so that when we start writing down index numbers and things, it all makes sense is we still write them down this way so that the analysts don't think we're weird, but we number them with the highest numbered one here, the lowest numbered one on the right hand side. So every time uh, taking an action will pl pluck off the highest numbered uh, 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 um, <coughs> argument. Uh, there isn't, because we kind of assume that we pre know these values, the same sorts of considerations are sort of not really there when we talk about the coefficients. Um, but I'm just choosing to be consistent and numbering the coefficients the same way around that I'm numbering the arguments because I think if I didn't do that, uh, then life would be even more confused. My first algebra course was taught from a textbook that applies functions from the right instead of the left. That's one of the reasons why. Yeah, <laughs> rubbish algebra. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so the, the the I've still got the book on my shelf if anybody wants to torture himself. <laughs> right. So the, the other the other option for for doing this is exactly that uh, we have to for one of these two areas of maths not use the notation which is conventional for that area of maths and like that 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 way lies even more madness. Um, there's something similar to this that happens in group theory as well. Yeah. There's like a, a fight about whether you're a group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same, it's the same idiocy. Um, so, uh, right, okay, so uh, we are, um, we do have a few minutes left. So um, I think what I will uh, do is um, as the final stunt, um, now that we've talked about actions, is um, attempt to then introduce the chain rule, because that's what's going to happen uh, all the way through. Right? Basically, all of uh, the uh, tangent linear model is just a chain rule, and the adjoint models are just a chain rule applied backwards. It's, it's all of that's what's going on. So let's assume. Um. <laughs> okay, so now we're uh, starting to write down something that is going to look really familiar to anyone who's actually done any adjoint PDE stuff. So let's just assume that our functional, so J is going from uh, U, so it's going from semicolon U across V to R. So it's a functional. Uh, this set of parameters M comes from somewhere uh, and the U comes from somewhere else and U is also a function of M. And so what we want is EJDM, where I mean big D. So I, I, I do want to differentiate through uh, this guy over here. And so uh, that is, um, Equivalence. So, um, abusing notation ever, ever so slightly, because when I introduced the notation, the original notation, I talked about the positions, and now I'm going to talk about what's in there. But it's easier. It's easier to write this down this way. So the easy part of this is uh, that part of the solution to this is uh, partial J, uh, partial M. Um, 
right? So that is, so I didn't actually explicitly introduce the difference between the these and the partials, but it is exactly what you're expecting. So uh, this one I get by taking my limit only adding epsilon times m hat to this m and ignoring the fact that this one changes. Right, that's a, the, the partial derivative as opposed to the full derivative. And the term partial is uh, in the, the, the hint partial is in the name. And so um, I then need uh, the J U. Um, and um, so I guess you can dot. So the meaning here is the action of um, the JDU on D, and I do mean big D now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and in the direction, and, um, those are the same. Uh, behind it, eventually the same amount. So, um, what uh, what that just meant? So this means evaluate this and put it into this slot. This is a function. So um, let's. I think it's useful now to write down all the spaces that are involved here because that will kind of explain what's going on. Um, so this thing is in um, uh, so the parameterized spaces out here kind of don't really matter very much right now because we've chosen you of M and M. So the thing that really matters here is this guy is in um, the R. Choose an M hat from B, and it gives me something back from R, which is equivalent to B star. Sorry, David. Yeah. Uh, in your initial definition of J, did the semicolon want to be at the end of the U times V, not the beginning? Yes. Yeah. Well done, thank you. Um, right, and so and this guy over here uh, is in uh, U, so R, um, so that's U star. This guy over here is in B to you, right? Because you give me something I chose in B and it gives you a U back. So we can see these are only the, the only cases that we care, uh, we care about. Um, and so um, <laughs> what essentially happens, so we're just about out of time, but I can do the, I can do the sort of adjoint spoiler so that I can be, uh, um, can't be accused of not having done anything in the first lecture about adjoints when I uh, said that this is going to be a series about adjoints. Um, so um, the adjoint uh, spoiler here is so uh, you give me something in V, I give you something back in R is a calculation that I can presumably do in. Um, something like order of V. So that's fine. Um, you give me something in uh, U of R and uh, I give you um, some uh, a number back is similarly something which presumably happens in the same amount of time and space. But if I have to build this guy, <clears throat> this thing is, 
potentially non-sparse u uh, times v big. And so if I'm going to build this guy in, and apply it to this guy, then um, this thing is going to explode. It's going to be um, uh, u big. It's got to be v big, but it's going to be u times v big, potentially dense. Um, and so that's going to completely ruin your day. And effectively, that's a, uh, an n by n square matrix. And the only thing I was going to do is feed it to this guy, which is going to multiply it by a vector. So that's a complete waste of time. So essentially, what I'd like to do is first evaluate this guy. So I've got something in U star. And then instead of having the thing in U star eat the thing over here, i.e. multiply onto that matrix and uh, remove it, I'd like to substitute this guy into here and then evaluate this thing. But I'm now doing a reverse substitution because usually I get to take things from U and things in U star eat things in U. And here I'm going the other way around. But Reese representation theorem, there is a relationship between things in uh, V and things in, um, in V star. And so <laughs> essentially what I'm doing is turning this operation around so that it goes the other way around and it's efficient. That's what the adjoint is. And so it being 5 to 12, next time we'll start worrying about actually doing that.